Thank you so much, Martha and Michelle. I'm Robert Green, a medical geneticist at Harvard Medical School. And I'm joined today for a conversation about genomics research, race and ethnicity, and the challenges for diversifying research with Professor Evelyn Hammonds of Harvard University. So thank you, Evelyn, so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, we've talked a little bit about practice meets policy, about getting in, me down in the weeds, <laughs> trying to recruit patients for my uh, actual clinical trials. And, and you up in the Olympian Heights of academia, <laughs> uh, really studying this with great, great scholarship. So I, I've been looking forward to this conversation a lot. Um, maybe we could start off with you telling us a little bit about your background and how it specifically how it relates to the topic of medical research um, and any initial thoughts you might have mm -hmm. about medical research with genetics and genomics, mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll do the same. Okay, well, thanks, Robert. I'm Evelyn Hammonds. I am the uh, Barbara Gutman Rosenkranz Professor of the History of Science uh, here at Harvard. I'm also a professor of African and African American Studies, and also a professor of uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences at School of Public Health. So um, I, I came to this work um, on, um, on medicine uh, from the time that I did my dissertation, which turned into a book about the history of the control of diphtheria in New York City, 1880 to um, 1930. And uh, even from that particular point, what I was really interested in was the relationship between uh, medical theory, uh, clinical practice, and then public health practice. And of course, diphtheria is a very virulent childhood disease. It was pretty much out of control throughout much of the, most of the 19th century into the early 20th century until we had active immunization campaigns. And so it offered an opportunity for me to look at how knowledge that was produced in the laboratory, which was the bacteriological research on the um, diphtheria bacilli, and then how the clinicians understand that work and practicing physicians. And then how did public health act, uh, advocates convince a, a, a skeptical public in, in the you know, contentious New York City to believe that these um, immunizations would actually end up um, saving their children's lives? And so it's that three-pronged approach to try to understand um, scientific and medical theory, laboratory science, clinical settings, and public health in the streets that has animated a lot of my work um, from that time to the present. And I moved from that to studying the impact of HIV AIDS on African-American communities and specifically African-American women. And in that uh, work, I've been really um, committed to trying to understand how certain groups of people in the face of um, outbreaks of epidemic disease become marginalized and become invisible to um, physicians, become invisible to public health pre prevention programs. And, and how does that continue to happen? And of course, it's very easy for lots of people now to say, well, you know, the AIDS epidemic is under control. Um, <clears throat> we have drugs that can keep it under, keep viral loads at very, very low levels. At the same time, Right now in Atlanta, uh, for example, very, very high rates of HIV among African-American women who are really, really on the margins of society, who many of them are um, suffer from uh, drug abuse, from um, multiple forms of, of social stigma that has allowed the, the um, epidemic of HIV to stay rooted in those in neighborhoods where those women live, largely poor neighborhoods um, in Atlanta. And, and for me personally, not even 20 miles away from where I grew up in, in the city of Atlanta is this happening. And so that's 30 some long years uh, away from the beginning of the HIV epidemic. So I've been very curious and very committed as well to trying to understand what factors lead to the sedimentation of a disease that can be controlled but not be controlled mm -hmm. in particular populations. And then of course, I've also been interested in the long history of, um, of um, 
medicine in the United States with respect to African American communities. So, um, so my work spans a long period of time from <laughs> at least 1619 to the present, trying to understand um, more deeply how system, systemic racism and institutional racism uh, has persisted. Uh, and, and, and therefore limited access of, of African-Americans and other groups of color in this country to the most uh, advanced um, medical uh, innovations uh, in our history right now. And uh, we still have these huge gaps. So that's where my, I think that's some of yeah. the big picture of what I try to do in my work. That's a perfect lead in to our conversation because this next wave of technology in genomics and multiomics is, is what I really want to ask you about. Um, uh, as we enter that discussion, I'll just summarize that I'm a medical geneticist who has specialized in clinical trials and epidemiological studies, mm -hmm. um, most recently over the past 15 years in genomics. And so that's really been a lot of blocking and tackling on the ground, bringing uh, individuals into clinical research studies, and most mm -hmm. recently bringing them into clinical research studies that offer to sequence their DNA and give them the results back. Yes. And um, we have been uh, more successful than most in terms of recruitment, in terms of inclusion, in terms of making sure, for example, in our series of return of results on Alzheimer's disease, we were able to consistently bring 20, 25% of individuals of African ancestries into our research pool. But it mm -hmm. took a lot of the techniques and, and uh, strategies that this whole conference is talking about. It took interactions with the community. It took working with Morehouse and Howard. It took uh, uh, working with churches and communities, advisory boards, all, all of those, all of those tried and true strategies to try to achieve a certain amount of, of diversification in our research population. But when we enter into research into clinical genetics, into DNA, mm -hmm. we've, we, we're sort of entering a new set of headwinds. So we all know that ancestry and DNA are interwoven. We don't yes. quite understand, the population doesn't quite understand exactly how or why, but it injects a whole new element into it uh, alongside the historical mistrust and so forth. As, as you've thought about, um, sort of this new area, you know, you talked about infectious disease, you talked about HIV treatments, now this whole new area of genetics and genomics. Um, what do you think are the special challenges that um, accrue, not just for recruitment, but for the entire integration and implementation of genomics into medical science? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I mean, of course, that entry of genomics into medical science doesn't come without a history. And so um, I, I think one of the, uh, there's, there are many, many reasons here and, and, and you've covered some of them. We can't sort of parse out the history of, of actually racism in medicine from the present, okay? Because we are, still, we are still deeply engaged in that history. And what genetics brings is something that, you know, um, it, it's, it, 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 it really re-inscribes um, the notion that there's something fundamentally biologically different between white groups of people and black and brown groups of people and Asian groups of people as well. And that notion of, of, of fundamental biological difference, which of course in, in American society also speaks to the value placed on different groups of people, uh, it's brought back an old story that many times in the history of medicine, we thought had um, been resolved. So of course, in the early, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, you know, race was an integrated idea. It spoke to issues of character, behavior, intelligence, as well as bodily differences and physical differences. And somehow all of that was carried somehow in the blood. This is at the dawn of genetics, right? but it's carried in the blood and you pass it on down through generation after generation after generation, right? So even as we move forward in the 20th century, we get to this um, identification and discovery of DNA, we get to the sequencing of the, of the genome, we have this new kind of information about human variation. Now, now there's no debate that humans differ, 
right? There's variation in the human species. That's not the issue. The issue is what we make of that, right? And so we make, we, 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 we continue to build the story in the present off of what we did in the past. So genetics is understood even by medical practitioners in a way that suggests it's determinative of behavior and of a particular risk factors for disease as opposed to being statistical, statistical and probabilistic. Um, we don't teach statistics, statistics very well in this country. Most people don't know how to think st statistically and probabilistically about things like um, disease. We and so we resort back to if the genes say this, then that's what it is. And that there's, you know, that, that, that what the genes tell us can't never be changed um, and that is fixed. And so yeah. we, we have that history and we can't seem to walk away from it uh, in any way. So we have these sort of um, different kinds of approaches to get people to understand what genetics tells us, but it doesn't break through those past just so stories about um, the genes for X, the genes for Y, the fact that you can't change them. I mean, if your kid is born with certain kind of genes, it's going to turn out to be a certain kind of person. And there's no hope of, of, of any sort of environmental uh, um, impact on what the genes already tell us. So it's all of that sort of very loose, very inaccurate gene talk that permeates our society. And, and physicians and, and medical researchers and genomicists are no less uh, susceptible to that kind of gene talk than many other people, even though we would expect them to know better. And I'd say some of the best work, of course, people do know better, but we're getting to a very small sort of strata of people who understand the probabilistic nature of, of genetic um, um, re results. And yeah, yeah. for African-Americans and people of color, Robert, come on. People are still experiencing on a daily basis medical and clinical encounters where they're disrespected. They're not listened to. People don't understand um, the, the medical practitioners that they are engaged with uh, simply you know, resort to kind of shorthand that many black and brown people who are not in those professions do not like, do not understand and wanna keep their distance from. Mm -hmm. And that's probably exacerbated by the notion of me being a guinea pig or I don't want to be a guinea pig right. in the in the research arena. Right. Um, you know, I love that term. You talked about reinscribing uh, certain older ideas like like the uh, old one drop rule um, in history uh, almost could be seen to be reiterated in the fascination with ancestry. And, yes. you know, do I have a little bit of African ancestry? Do I have a lot of African ancestry? So this has been the subject of fascination, you know, the whole roots phenomenon, um, your colleague Skip Gates and right. his fantastically successful PBS uh, shows on, on ancestry. Right. And uh, the, the, this, is, this has actually been talked about as an attractant, as a means of engaging communities of color in right. genomics research. Yeah. So, you know, at the same time that it reiterates, or in your words, reinscribes some of the sort of deterministic, uh, strange stereotypes from the past, it also offers perhaps a doorway into re-engagement in the present. Any thoughts about that? Because part of our, a part of our hope in this conference is to think about novel ways in which we can redefine or redeploy ourselves to, to try to start to address some of these equity and inclusion problems in medical research. Right, sure. You know, I, I think what has to, we need a different kind of engagement right now. And that engagement I would hope would lead to more successful marriages. <laughs> so, and that is between an ethics of care and a commitment to research. And using research, uh, the, the research part is to use the newest most, you know, sort of um, uh, vetted tools to understand you, um, all the different kinds of, of, not just infectious diseases, but other kinds of diseases uh, in, in the diverse population of, of, of that the United States represents. 
But we want to do that and we want to use the best science and we want to understand that, but it has to be married to a different ethics of care. And the ethics of care part is speaks back to the history where too many black and brown people feel that they walk into a medical encounter and it's just not going to turn out well. They're not going to be treated with the kind of care that would allow them to see the ways in which these new techniques, technologies that genomics brings is actually going to help them. Is and, there... so, and so there's, a, there's, there's just a sense of skepticism. Why should we believe you now? Why should we trust you now? You've used your new tools on us before and it didn't work out that well for us. So why I mean, should it seems, it's gonna work that well now? It seems almost overwhelming um, you know, when you put it that way. And I think at many points in this conference, um, there is so, so much history, so much interdigitated uh, destructive past um, and, and present. Um, can we say something about how we can try either incrementally or tr in a transformative way to, to change the medical research enterprise. Yeah. So um, is the, is there, are there ideas we can put in place? And, and one of them in specific I wanna ask you about is returning research results. So the medical research enterprise has traditionally gathered data for our, you know, our scientific purposes and you're the participant, used to be called the subject, but now you're the participant. You don't get anything back. Right. Um, we get all the data. Thank you for your altruism. Or maybe you know we give you some um, some some funding for your travel or for your trouble. But um, it's it's basically you're the you're the subject. We're the researcher. Right. That's changing dramatically in the sense that you are now a participant in the research. And one of the contentious but revolutionary changes in that in that uh, dichotomy is that researchers are struggling with how much to give participants information back. And it's nowhere as contentious as in genomics. If you, Evelyn, participate in one of my research projects, I'm gonna fight like hell to give you back genetic information that could potentially save your life. Believe it or not, that is a contentious issue. In, the United believe, States is yes. one of the only countries that's doing that in the world. And even the United States, there's lots of people who think that shouldn't be done or want right. to draw limits on it. Right. What do you, given that, that research, medical research is an offshoot of medical care, and given that most medical research takes <laughs> place under the institutional umbrella of an institution that you know, provides clinical care, participants often conflate research with clinical care. And I think their expectation is, whether this is white folks or people of color that that their expectation is if you find something that could save my life, I expect you to tell it to me. Yeah, um, so, and that's so you certainly just said, been, yeah, you just well, said just participants, one go ahead. That's, that's one, la and, and that's been our experience in the Jackson Heart Study, the all African-American Jackson Heart Study, where we're the first ones to return genomic information to this population that's being studied epidemiologically in, um, in uh, in Mississippi. So, excuse me for interrupting, but no, that, I no, just want okay. to lay that groundwork and get your get your perception of this this research clinical balance and and how it plays out in the in the thoughts that you were were talking to us about. See, I I, I think what you said is about you know the sort of that the participants have the expectation that the information should be returned to them. Uh, um, and and that that they're the ones you know doing the conflation of, of 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 about care and what research is, but the research should be given back to them because that's that that is part of a general I would say expectation of, of ethics of care, and particularly for for people who are from populations where that that the whole long history of being used to produce new medical knowledge but not have that new medical knowledge actually serve them is ever present in those communities and um mm -hmm. and so for 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 the information not to come back versus that you just you just used me for for as if i'm some kind of scientific object with no human um considerations and that's that's considered that that's widely considered not to be the case so but but I think what needs to change there, there are many many things that need to change 
First, I think the medical curriculum needs to change where the history of medicine, in particular with respect to the histories of, of the um, impact of medical and public health policies on uh, disenfranchised communities, needs to be taught to medical students. Not the two lectures I give at Harvard Medical School every year to the first year class. That's not going to get it. And then secondly, I think a reevaluation of this of, of the ways in which the, the this these ethical issues about the ethics of care have to also be front and center in that in in that uh, in in those curricula. But the last thing is we have not solved the problem of why it is still so difficult to increase the diversity of the population of medical researchers. And that is connected to the other work that I've been long engaged with for over 30 years of how do we, con how do we increase the numbers of, under of, of minorities who are underrepresented in uh, the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. Why are we having such a problem doing this? And native born minorities, African-Americans, Latinx folks, Native Americans and others who continue to be too, there are just too few of us. I sit here at, at, in, um, in, at Harvard University in Harvard College and I have often been, been told by my students uh, of color uh, that I am the first black woman professor they have ever had. How can that be in the 21st century? How can we continue to not be able to solve that problem? And it is not being solved by any programs that support a kind of deficit model. There's something wrong with these black and brown people that just can't get the science right. And they aren't mm -hmm. being successful because there are no more barriers after affirmative action. Everybody, the doors are all open for everybody, but the doors aren't all open. And until- What do you mean by deficit it, model? What, what does that deficit mean? Deficit model, the deficit model suggests that uh, the reason that under that uh, minority groups in the US aren't uh, uh, present in STEM fields at higher rates is because there's some deficit within those groups. Uh, okay. Either their attitudes about science or their failure to take the appropriate classes or all kinds of, you know, those, the, the, so the model is not there are institutional problems that need to be fixed, but there are problems facing that these groups have that need to be mm -hmm. fixed in them. So we need to be nicer to them. We need to uh, get them into a whole bunch of special programs. But well, we've been doing that for about 30 something years and we're not, we're not moving that needle very far at all. Yeah, and there's that, a parallel to that. Yeah, sorry, there's a parallel to that in, in research because, um, investigators who are trying to meet NIH targets for, right. you know, uh, I, I, need, I need this percent of people of color in my research recruitment pool, um, end up feeling very frustrated. They feel that people of color are in some way resistant to, yes. the, to, to this. So I guess it's a sort of blaming process, which is, is, is the parallel to that deficit model. Right. Now, they, they, they often resort to um, paying people. And that, yes. uh, that it, what, what do you, I think, I think that first of all, engenders further, you know, uh, resentment in the researcher sometimes, yes. um, but also plays in, in a weird way to that deficit model. Like if I have to pay for this, it's, you know, it's a different kind of volunteerism. On right. the other hand, uh, supporting people when they travel, take time away from work, take time away from families where they might not have coverage. I mean, that all makes sense. How do you see the issue of investigators paying <coughs> people of color, for example? And what would you think ethically of a research study, and, and the IRB would never approve this, but what would you think ethically of a research study that offered to pay people of color differentially from white people to be recruited? So first, I think the two categories have to be disaggregated. It is, it, it, so we, we're dealing with generalized distrust on the part of, of, of uh, communities of color of the research enterprise. So we know that's, that's a baseline pretty much. But mm -hmm. also it makes perfect sense to me that you would you could you would might pay people to be a part of a research study if it costs them to to get into the study. So for example, you know, one of the largest communities of, of people of color in the Boston area, for example, is Dorchester and Roxbury. It's not that easy to get from Dorchester and Roxbury to downtown Boston to MGH. It's just not that easy. So you want to make it easy for someone to be in, involved in that? Then think about the economic, socioeconomic uh, issues they have to confront in order to make it possible for them to do it. 
And that would apply for any of the white groups and white individuals who had, a, who had you know, the same kind of socioeconomic barriers to get there uh, to participate as well. So mm -hmm. you need to think about both class and race and, and ethnicity and the failures of the Boston metro system in order <laughs> to get people to come in to be a part of this. That should be the picture. Uh, that you, and, and so researchers need to, to step back a bit from the sense that there's some resistance. Resistance exists to the extent that it does because there are real absolute barriers to participation. And you want to make those barriers come down, then do something creative to do it. And, you know, of course, back in the day, we've we've done all different kinds of things. You know, remember from Harvard Medical School, you used to have the bus that used to travel mm -hmm. around and do just sort of basic, you know, um, medical checkup kinds of things in communities of color where people just didn't feel comfortable coming to MGH, couldn't take time off to come to MGH, uh, all yeah. those kinds of things. Uh, and so those are, those, there's nothing wrong with those kinds of things. And then we think about it at a national level. We still have places in the American South where I grew up in Atlanta, um, and there are places in, in parts of Georgia that d in terms of access for people of color to, to um, basic health care is practically non-existent. And it's yeah. the 21st century. So we need Everyone, to keep these things in mind. We have to wrap up. There's not enough time to keep going this fascinating conversation. But in the final 30 seconds, let me ask you uh, to react personally. Um, I haven't asked you this before, I don't believe, uh, but if you had the opportunity to get your own genome sequence as part of a research study and get some of the results back, what's your sort of short but instantaneous reaction, both as a human being and as a woman of color? Um, I would say, I'll put it this way, uh, 10 years ago, I would have said, or less than 10 years, I would have said, absolutely not. I will absolutely not do this for you. Uh, but now... <laughs> I am much more interested and I am much more, uh, uh, I understand much more that, that I could learn things that would be important to me, to um, my descendants, uh, to my son's children uh, that would be important to do. So I would say yes, but you're gonna have a hard time getting me. You're gonna have to assure me that the right things are gonna be done if I engage in that with you. All right. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom. I, I, I love the idea that uh, your theory uh, meets my practice and uh, <laughs> that we can learn from each other. And I hope we can continue the conversation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.